Which brings us to tonight's uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Colin Gonzalez. I'd like to say a few words just to introduce uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez is a senior advocate at the Indian Supreme Court and is the executive director of the Human Rights Legal Network in India. Mr. Gonzalez is a pioneer in his field of public inter interest litigation and he has successfully brought a number of cases dealing with economic, social, and cultural rights. Many of these cases have been decided by the Supreme Court and have been set as precedents uh, for the rest of the country. Mr. Gonzalez started his career as a civil engineer, but was drawn to the law through his work in unions and his concerns over labor issues and exploitation. In 2004, Mr. Gonzalez won the International Human Rights Award of the American Bar Association in public recognition of his contribution to the area of human rights. He's also the founder of the Indian Center for Human Rights and Law, an independent one-stop inf information center for anyone involved in public interest law. Tonight, Colin is accompanied by his wife, Breathe Verma, who is a well-known human rights activist and lawyer in her own right, and their beautiful baby daughter, Tara. So with uh, no further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Colin Gonzalez. I really am humbled by the honor of speaking to you here today. I studied Jaswan Singh Kalra's work, what he did to expose human rights violations in the Punjab, his martyrdom at the hands of the Punjab police. And over the last few days, I spoke to some of my Sikh friends in Canada. Some of their sufferings and pain, their relatives, who have also suffered at the hands of the Punjab police. And I've done so little. I have suffered so little. I feel I don't deserve really this honor of speaking to you here today. Kalra Saab stood at this podium in 1995. He had uncovered thousands of Sikh boys and girls. Protesters, somewhat militant, somewhat outspoken, democratic rights organizations, trade union people, young people exercising democratic rights. He had the list of persons supposedly missing, but in reality picked up by the Punjab police, tortured and their bodies cremated without their relatives being told. He came to Canada. He, he spoke to the press and he spoke to the public about those lists. And he spoke here in the parliament building. And just before he was to leave and go back to India, he received a warning from India that he should not return. And he said, that if I don't expose the story, who will? I must do it, it is my duty. I must go back and say what has happened. And all the rest is history. We know that he went back to India and then he was picked up from his house one morning, tortured and his body thrown into the bias. When you look at his work and you look at the risk he took, and you look at the continuing risk that people in the Punjab take even today, we realize that we have come a long way, but we have a very, very long way to go. And I don't want to really lecture you very much about the condition of, of human rights in India today, but I will say a few words about the situation that, it, that exists. Many of you have relatives and friends in the Punjab, many of you travel up and down. And we share the exuberance of India's 8% gross domestic product. We know the incredible wealth that India has comparable to any country in the world. We know the massive houses that Indians have, the BMWs and the Mercedes Benzes that they drive, the wealth that they have, the economic power that they have, not just within India, but in the world. 
the Sikh community has built India in no small measure as a powerful engine of change. And I suspect that in Canada you will build this nation also into a powerful, powerful economic force and a powerful democratic force as well. So we, we enjoy and we embrace this growth. And we are happy that India is doing as well as it does. But there is another side, and that's the reason why I'm here today. There's a dark side to India. And that is the side of hunger, poverty, deprivation, displacement, and destituteness. And we cannot imagine that a country with an 8% growth rate should have today 70% of its population below roughly half a dollar a day. The Central government set up a report to look at poverty in India and the Arjun Sen Committee report concluded that 77% of India are less, are, are, are living on less than 20 rupees a day, half a dollar. What an amazing statistic. And you try and say, why is this happened? Why has India become the hunger capital of the world? Why do we have a 50% malnutrition rate, men, women, and children? 17% of all children in India grow up stunted with a shrunken brain and stunted body. Why has it happened? What is this economic model that allows an 8% growth rate and such unimaginable wealth for 350 million people and you have 750 million people below a poverty line of half a dollar a day? How has this happened? And then you you realize that the economic model is one where money is everything, where the lust and greed for money is everything. Do what you want, break whatever laws you want to break, bribe whoever you want to bribe. Do what it takes, but make your money. And it's an economic model where social values, morality, the old social democratic structure, all this has become irrelevant. All this can go. All this is meaningless. So you look at your education system and you realize the government schools are closing. The children have to go to private schools and the rates in the private schools, the fees in the private schools are skyrocketing. You look at your hospitals, your wonderful public hospitals that you had once upon a time, and you see that your public hospitals are crumbling and the poor have nowhere to go. They can go to a private hospital if they can afford to pay. And as far as food is concerned, I've told you we have a 50% malnutrition rate. And in the Punjab, I do this case in the Supreme Court on the right to food. In the Punjab, just about a month ago, there was grain lying out in the open, rotting. And our prime minister was unwilling to give the grain to the people to eat. We have 60 million tons of grain lying in the go-downs of India, and you have hunger and malnutrition and poverty at this rate. And the Supreme Court asked the central government, they said, if you have 60 million tons of grain rotting, some of it rotting in the Punjab, rats eating at it, why don't you give it to the people to eat? And the government said, no, we'll not give it to them. And then you realize that this understanding of the market as being the driving force means that either you buy or you die. Either you buy your food or you die. Either you pay for your medicines or you go as you are without treatment. Either you pay for education or you remain uneducated. The whole notion of taking people along with you as one nation, taking everybody along with you as one nation, that model of development has for the last 10 or 20 years gone, disappeared. So the 350 million people go ahead. That's one India. 750 million people remain behind. That's the second India. And this is the reality of modern India. And then there's a darker side. There's a darker side of violence. In a land of Mahatma Gandhi and nonviolence, 
Eastern spiritualism, you have some of the most violent practices the world has ever seen. Kalra Saab discovered the tip of the iceberg with several thousand people disappeared. Can you imagine several thousand people disappearing in any country? And that was just one state, you know, some districts of one state. Unimaginable violence. Our Home Minister recently said, one third of all the administrative districts of India, 220 out of 640 administrative districts, are under significant levels of armed struggle. Isn't it amazing? The largest democracy in the world, an Asian tiger, today you could say a world tiger in terms of world economy, and you have one third of the country under significant levels of armed struggle, and you have three quarters of the population starving. Time is very short to go into what kind of economic model this is, what kind of political model, but hunger, malnutrition, and violence happens by design. It's not accidental. It's not accidental to the model of development. It happens by design. The 84 genocide of the Sikhs on the streets of Delhi, thousands of Sikhs killed, massacred, in the capital city, with the army garrisons just outside, with massive police reinforcements possible, with the political elite, the prime minister, the home minister, there, with the army generals all parked in Delhi, was an unbelievable event. We all know that. We're not here to go into that again. But why do we talk of 84? Even though it's something that has happened now so long ago, why do we talk of 84? We talk of 84 because the wounds of 1984 have not healed. Every time we see a policeman decorated for killing people, getting promotions for killing people, our wounds open up. Every time we see the accused who ought to be behind bars walk free, our wounds open up. Every time we see criminals who were killers and who organized killing become ministers in the present government, our wounds open up. Every time we see KPS Gill being lauded, being applauded for having solved the problems of the Punjab, our wounds open up. I went to the NHRC in Kalra Saab's case. Kalra Saab took his case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court directed the NHRC to investigate and award compensation. You won't believe it, in the NHRC, the stand of the government was that these persons who died, died in police custody. Government counsel said, yes, they were in our custody when they died. In cross-examination, I asked, how did they die if they were in your custody? The answer was, they were enemy agents. We took them with us to discover the hideouts of the terrorists, and in the crossfire, they died. Just think about that answer. It is the clearest admission of the use of under trials. People against whom there's a charge, but there's not a proven charge. They've not been convicted. It's the clearest admission of the use of under trials as a human shield. It's a war crime. We say genocide, mass elimination of a community, state-sponsored. It's a war crime that you should take a person and use them as a human shield is a war crime. And the National Human Rights Commission gave us compensation of $5,000 for killing in custody. $5,000 per person. Our wounds open up. And that case, my dear friends, is now in the Supreme Court. Paramjit Kaur has taken that case to the Supreme Court, where we challenge the compensation 
given to us as being insulting to our community and to the people who died. The riot cases are also going on, but many of those persons who are guilty are now, have now escaped. Evidence against them has been compromised. But one person, Sajjan Kumar, will go behind bars, I can tell you that. I've been following that case closely, and Fulka Saab, whom you know very well, is arguing that case magnificently in the trial court and in the high court and the Supreme Court. The eyewitnesses against Sajjan Kumar have spoken clearly in court. They have not been compromised, and they have stood up despite threats given to them. And Sajjan Kumar will go behind bars, but he was just one of the hundreds who should have gone behind bars. The criminal justice system, when it came to the prosecution of persons who engaged in such a massacre, that criminal justice system failed us. And the reason why we talk of 1984 is not because we want to open up the old wounds and think about the past, but because there's a very important lesson for us today in contemporary India. And there's a very important lesson, not just for the Sikh community, but for the Muslims and the Christian and for all Indians. If in 1984 the criminal justice system had worked, if the prosecution had happened, if those politicians had gone behind bars and those policemen who were complicit in the killings had gone behind bars, would the riots of 1992 have happened? In 1992, remember, 3,000 Muslims were killed on the streets of Bombay. In 2002, 3,500 Muslims were killed on the streets of Ahmedabad and Baroda in Gujarat. And in 2007, 150 Christians were killed in Khandamal and Orissa. What is this thing about India, which is supposed to be a non-violent spiritual country? What is this thing that allows you to kill people, massacre them en masse? You shoot a man in his head, you go to jail, but you massacre a thousand people with police support and political support and you run free? What is this? And 84 is important because it tells us that we have to change our system so that it never happens that a killing can take place or a massacre can take place or a riot can take place and the criminal justice system will not work because the law enforcers are the law breakers those who are supposed to prosecute are the persons running riot and doing the killing it's an important lesson for the whole of india today one more thing i am told has said when he came to Canada, that the Sikhs should move on and that they should forget the past. Perhaps if Manmohan Singh took his job seriously and our home department took their job seriously and prosecuted people even now, it's not too late, our wounds would heal and we would move on and we would forget the past. But as long as justice is not done to the Sikh community, as long as the persons are not prosecuted, there will never be peace. Generation after generation will remember the suffering and pain and anguish of the people. And they will remember doubly that no one was punished, that justice was not done. We talk of 1984 for yet another reason, stigma. In 1984, the state refined its technique of attacking you and then stigmatizing the victim. The Sikhs were called separatists, terrorists. In Bombay, the Muslims were called terrorists. You massacre 3,000 Muslims on the streets of Bombay and then you turn around and say they're terrorists. In Manipur today, killing after killing in the Northeast, unbelievable killing using the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which gives the security forces the right to kill on suspicion. Hundreds of people killed and the Manipuris stigmatized as separatists and insurgents. In Kashmir, decades of suffering, decades of killing, unbelievable suffering, not a single home, 
without a boy, without a girl, without a father, without an uncle being killed. Unbelievable suffering. Killing after killing after killing. Not a single officer punished. Not a single person taken to task. And today when the Kashmiris say Azadi, freedom, we want freedom from this oppression, they are stigmatized as separators. And in Chhattisgarh, all human rights activists, where, where the corporations go in to do mining, all human rights activists, stigmatized and characterized as Naxal sympathizers. You know the case of Binayak Sen, he was a doctor working in the remote areas of Chhattisgarh. He was working among the tribals. His crime was that when he went into jail to treat a particular person who was a, a Naxalite, he went into jail to treat him. They filed a case against him saying that he had taken a letter from that person and he gave that letter to somebody else. That letter said nothing. When it turned up in court, that letter said nothing. And yet Binayak Sen, India's foremost doctor working among the poor, recognized internationally, spent three years in jail and is now out on bail. A case of sedition and waging war against the state was filed against him. Binayak Sen, who came on television 100 times saying, I do not believe in violence, like all of us do. We do not believe in violence. We do not promote violence. We do not encourage violence. We do not tolerate violence. The World Sikh Organization, I've had discussion with you. You make it very clear that violence is not our creed. We want to move by democratic means. We want to use legal avenues for the solution of our problems. Benayak Sen said that a hundred times. And the charge against Benayak Sen was waging war against the state and sedition. So stigmatizing, so you stigmatize. And I must tell you in the Sikh community that sometimes you feel that you've been stigmatized and things have been said about you that are so untrue and unjust that politicians and others should never have used that language against our community. But it's not true of you alone today. We stand with you, the whole of India stands with you. All those right across the country, from the Northeast to Kashmir, right down to the South of India, all those who have fought for human rights and democratic rights, who have spoken out fearlessly against government, who have not allowed themselves to be intimidated by the security forces, who have stood up despite repression, all of them on television and elsewhere, all of them have been stigmatized. I've been told 100 times on television debates, 100 times, you're human rights activists, you are silent when it comes to terrorism. Your human rights activists are the front face of terrorism. All of us. So right across the country, my dear friends, we remember that all those who fight against injustice, all of us, it's been a strategy of the Indian state to stigmatize them in some way or the other. I must tell you also of Buller's case because many of you have been following Mr. Buller's uh, death sentence now. And there's been an un unfortunate turn in the Supreme Court and there's been some unhappy developments in the Supreme Court. But Buller has been sentenced to death. And I, I must draw your attention, it was a three judge bench decision of the Supreme Court in Buller's case. I must draw your attention to one judge, M.B. Shah, who dissented and Shah said, Justice Shah said, the entire conviction hangs on a thread. It hangs on a confession made to a police officer, where apparently there's a thumb impression of Buller on his confession. There is no forensic evidence against him. The only evidence is that statement made to a police officer, which under Indian law is not admissible in evidence. It was only admissible in evidence under that treacherous act called TADA, the Terrorist and Disrupt uh, Disruptive Activities Act, TADA. For a very short period of time while that act was in force, confessions to police officers were admissible as evidence. And in that short window, 
Buller's statement was apparently taken with his thumb impression, and on that basis he was sent to the, he, he is to be sent to the gallows. M.B. Shah said, not only is the issue of the death penalty one before us, I would say, said Justice Shah, that this man deserves to be acquitted. He cannot be convicted on this kind of, or specious kind of evidence. And M.B. Shah made a sterling dissent in that judgment. Buller's case will also be now fought in the Supreme Court before a larger bench. It, uh, times are very difficult and it looks very, the road ahead seems very hard. But uh, we hope to have some good news in case the matter goes before a five-judge bench of the Supreme Court. It is possible, there's a remote possibility, but there is a possibility that Buller may get some good news in the time to come. Now this is pretty bad news as far as India is concerned. We are going through a very difficult period. The, uh, I've told you about the, the poverty, I've told you about the violence. But the silver lining in the cloud, so to speak, or the positive thing about India is that we have an army of volunteers and activists, and social activists, right throughout India. It is the joy of India. It is actually India's spirit. It's the heart of India that despite such suffering, thousands and thousands of young people, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, slum activists, women's activists, lawyers, doctors, large sections of society struggle against this oppression. It's a very difficult struggle because in the world outside, you see India as a shining, wonderful country, doing so well with such a wonderful growth rate and so on. It's very hard for foreigners. It's very hard for Americans, for Europeans, and for people outside to understand how can it be that a country which is supposed to be shining, a country that's supposed to be doing so well, how can it be that this country has such a dark side to it? And we must change that dark side. We have an army of volunteers, an army of activists, an army of people who struggle. Despite all the odds, we struggle to change the system. We want a system where economic progress goes hand in hand with morality. We want a system where economic progress goes hand in hand with social responsibility. You can't say the market will provide to people who are earning half a dollar a day. You can't say the market will give you education, the market will give you medicines, the market will give you food. There is a state responsibility to look after its people. That was the ideology in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, a social democratic model of society. Today, in globalization, we've gone to a very different model of money, money power, wealth, greed, corruption. It's a very different model. And we have to struggle collectively to bring India back onto the track of social democracy. India is the largest democracy in the world. If it goes in the direction it is going today, it will split. There will be unrest, there will be violence, there will be turbulence, there will never be peace. You cannot have peace with a large part of your population so unhappy, so restless, so angry, so frustrated. You can never have peace. In this democracy, you want peace. You can't have everybody equal, I understand, but you must try and take your country along with you, as was the principle some time back. For the Sikhs who are in Canada, what can you do? You have actually built a life for yourselves here. This is a beautiful country. This is really a country with a thriving democracy and you have participated in that democracy and made it richer and better. But I would say you still have a job in the Punjab and in India. You must reach out to your roots and to the places from where you have come. And you must join the struggle in India against oppression. 
And as you were fearless in your, in your business and your work, you must be fearless in your support of human rights. You must engage with the Punjab again. Today, the knock on the door at midnight is the same as before. Catching you by your collar, handcuffing you, putting a hood over your head at night is the same as before. Parents not knowing where your child has been taken, to which police station, where he has gone, with the police not bothering to answer is the same as before. The only difference is the bullet in the head that has gone down. Those numbers have gone down. But the terror is the same as before. And we must intervene. We must help. We must give political support. We must give social and moral support in some way. I really don't know the answer to this question. But we must engage with Punjab and India and strengthen the democratic rights process. We must look at the young in the Sikh community and in the Indian community as a whole. The young students, my colleague with whom I'm staying said this afternoon, we will never let our children forget. We will never let our children forget. They will not forget. They will not forget. And we must bring up a generation of people guided by that spirit that justice must be done. And if you have to fight for justice, we will fight, but we will see that justice is done. And therefore, nurture your students, both in Canada and in India, and tell the student community what happened in 84, what happened in 92 to the Muslims, what happened in 2002 to the Muslims in Gujarat, and what happened in 2007 to the Christians. In. Because no country in this world today has the terrible record of genocide has the terrible record of repeated genocide that our great and wonderful democratic India has. No country has this awful record. And it's time we take the camouflage away. We, it's time we tear the camouflage down and say, this is the real India. We're not interested in denigrating India. We love our country. We want to make it a great and powerful country. We believe India can be one of the greatest democracies in the world. Apart from being a great economy, India can be the greatest democracy in the world. We have the people. We have the spirit. We have the ideology. We have the spiritualism. We have the courage. And we have the tradition of martyrdom, where we can die for a cause. We have everything to make our nation a great democracy. Therefore, my dear friends, remember, the tide will turn. It is only a matter of time. Society as it is structured today in our country will not last. This tide will turn. Better times will come. Justice will be done. I hope in my time justice will be done. I'm not so young as I used to be, but I hope in my time justice will be done. And I think India will be, in the years to come, a great, a truly great nation. Thank you very much.